All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to Stew Street. I am your host, Sam Mora, and today I am sitting down with Chris and Catherine. They are the founders of Fireside, an NYU-based startup focused on bridging the gap between tech and VC professionals with students. I'm excited to have the opportunity to hear both of our wonderful guests elaborate on how Fireside has achieved their mission thus far and where they see it headed in the future. Therefore, without further ado, uh, let's get into it. Hey! Been trying to meet you. Mm. Hey! I was just truly engaged when I looked over the platform a little bit online, but I did want to hear a little bit more background about uh, the specifics and logistics behind it, if you could elaborate. Yeah, of course. So initially, both of us were interested into getting into venture capital. I had been doing startups for a while, but at the same time, I uh, considered VC kind of this black box, right? It's one of the components that's necessary to be able to launch a startup unless you bootstrap it. But at the same time, a lot of success stories are venture capital backed startups. But from the founder and builder side, I was like, okay, so this exists. Money comes from here, but how does it actually work behind the scenes, right? And in trying to learn about VC and how it actually works, I realized there's a big chicken and egg problem here, right? If you do not know that much about VC, it's going to be pretty hard to find a mentor in it that'll kind of show you the ropes. And without that, you know, such as a mentor, it's actually really hard to know what resources you should be looking into. There's a lot of great depth in terms of resources, some awesome books, you know, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, uh, Venture Deals. But at the same time, these books, either one, are a little bit too introductory or two, are a little bit too in-depth, right? There's a lot of great resources, but it's really hard to put them together in a way where you get a comprehensive picture of, well, how does actually, you know, uh, this concept connect with, you know, this other concept? And so what we, we're trying to do with Fireside is, first of all, we're creating a digital community for whether you're an undergraduate, graduate, or somebody, you know, mid-career and looking to learn about VC or just tech in general, providing that community and weekly speaker talks to be able to actually access that and connect on a one-to-one -one basis. We try to keep our calls around like 30 people. So there's enough of a variety of people within those you know, speaker events to have some different perspectives, but at the same time, it's not too impersonal to where you uh, can't actually connect with the speaker. And on top of that, one other thing we're doing uh, this year actually that we're super excited about is opening up a co-working space and like a collaborative event space and co-working space in New York. So really the main goal of all of this is to create community, right? Whether you're searching for deal flow within VC or just trying to learn about VC or whether you're a founder actually trying to get funded, uh, community is really the common, uh, lowest common denominator that we're, we're trying to seek here. And I like how you mentioned the fact of mentorship and the importance of that and somewhat creating that environment for students, especially because it's a difficult thing to, uh, to create. So in, in terms of building that community, how do you make that accessible to all types of students. Yeah, so join us. Yeah, sure. I think it was a matter of really spreading out our search for actual fellows in our program. And so through this fellowship, you actually get access to these speaker talks and all these different resources, right? And so we really contacted all types of schools and all types of clubs within these schools to see, oh, do you have like interested members that are either participating in like VC-based activities or tech activities? And so I think in actually just getting the word out to a very broad range of people, we've been able to access a lot more people that maybe weren't able to previously mm -hmm. get this VC education or tech education that they want. And with that education being out there, students are obviously looking for ways to expedite their career growth. And traditionally people going into VC might start out in investment banking, use that as somewhat of a stepping stone, whether it's going into VC or private equity. Uh, as those trends sort of change, what type of skill sets are you trying to provide these students with to be able to um, really succeed in those roles early on? Yeah, I think in terms of skill sets, VC is one of those weird ones where, yes, there are technicals, but at the same time, experience within some careers such as investment banking or having a background in like private equity, for example, is super helpful, right? For the most part, there's two real main ways that people get into VC, right? That's either one, more mid-career right? Um, they've been in investment banking or some other like finance or tech adjacent field, and then eventually go into VC. Or they can start in startups, 
get a really, really successful exit or, you know, have a great track record with startups and then eventually go into VC that way as well. Uh, in terms of like the skill set that, you know, is most important from every single person that we've talked to and, you know, as far as our knowledge of VC goes, it's really just curiosity and excitement and passion, right? And with these speaker talks, what we really want to do is have somebody go, oh, hold up, wait, wait, wait that, that could actually be me, right? Mm -hmm. And understanding that it is achievable in a sense. And with that spark of, okay, awesome, this is something I want to do. I know that it's achievable and it's reachable. And then from there, the learning kind of goes and, and, and stems off. But really in terms of resources, I think the number one would just be getting within that uh, ecosystem. I don't know if that's the right term for it, but essentially if you're within like that certain circle and you network and you, and you meet people, okay, fantastic, right? You're actually able to um, meet, meet, meet the right people. But without being able to break into that initially, that, that, that breaking in aspect is, is really hard, right? Uh, how do you actually reach that first VC? Some people might go about it with cold emailing or just going to events, but without that warm introduction, you're going to shoot a lot of blanks, right? It's going to be a lot of hard work to even just get in the right sphere in the first place, or you can get lost in, uh, you know, the wrong sphere, hypothetically, not to say that there is one, but not necessarily the optimal one, spend all the time networking there and meeting the people and putting in work and then realize, okay, wait, that wasn't necessarily the, the right area to focus on. And you, you talked about how you have speaker events and you're also are trying to set up one-on-one -on -one connections. Um, are those integrated with each other or are they separate events that students would have to attend? Yeah, so in terms of the speaker events, these are held weekly on Zoom. We have a pretty vi wide variety of people that go on, right? Um, last week, we had a startup founder who was one of the co-founders of a startup called Taskhuman. The week before that, or actually that week, we had an in-person event at um, a VC fund called Contrary at their office in New York. And we had some really awesome speakers. We had Alan Patrikoff, who is one of the co-founders of Great Car Partners, as well as an investor from RRE Ventures. So there's a pretty wide group of speakers that, that we do have. And so in that sense, a lot of people that are within the program are able to actually get somebody that's relevant to them, right? Like a cool person is a cool person objectively, right? But at the same time, there's different utility based on 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 the domain specificity, specificity of, of each of the connections. In terms of the one-to-one -one connections, uh, that's what we're really, really trying to do this year. Throughout this time doing the digital community stuff, we actually only spent probably, what, four days on, on doing like outreach to speakers. And it was actually pretty easy. And we thought that that was really going to be the bottleneck here. I think the number one thing that we've like realized is community, especially digital, is really, really, really hard to go about making. Uh, and that's where the shift to kind of in-person stuff is mm -hmm. happening. I still want to eventually have, you know, these like nodes throughout throughout the U.S. or throughout colleges where there is that, okay, this is cool. I'm friends with this person and we all know each other. And on top of that, okay, here's some other cool tech stuff. But that real first case study and example of that is what we're trying to do in New York uh, right now. Mm -hmm. So that will be done through the apartment. So you're starting with a focus at NYU for the in-person as sort of the, the main trial run and then expansion after that? I mean, the way to look at it kind of is just like, look, man, we got to get an apartment anyways. <laughs> so uh, a few, my, myself and some of my friends are are just pulling, pulling some stuff together and um, getting a place that's really optimized for hosting events, whether that be small dinners, whether that be, you know, uh, meet and greets or networking events or speaker mm -hmm. events or even... You know, honestly, trying to help out other founders in New York that might not necessarily even be college students, right? Like, let's say somebody raises, you know, $10 million or something like that, like really like solid amount. At that point, it's like, okay, man, congratulations. You want to host like a party. You want to host like a, you know, like um, a little bit of a social for your team because, you know, that's awesome. And let them use the space for free, right? And then that will kind of create that network effect there of, okay, cool, this person got to use the space. They invited some awesome people. Those awesome people, we say, hey, man, like, feel free to use the space whenever it's applicable and uh, just kind of expand from there. Have you guys had any kind of stories you can pinpoint um, thus far where you've truly helped out a student and changed his avenue in a sense? Um, I think, well, I can't say for sure if we've completely changed their avenue, but my friend that was really, really into like computer science, he throughout high school was doing a lot of like hackathons. He was super into CS and he went to the contrary event around like a week and a half ago. And he was like, oh my God, I've like 
I've heard of VC. I think I know what it is, but not really, right? But he went to the event. He listened to Alan. He listened to Jonathan speak. And he was like, oh my God, like these people are insanely smart. They're really good at what they do. And VC seems like an amazing field. And so mm -hmm. since then, he's really put an effort into researching what VC is, how to break into VC. And I think he's somewhat considering a shift into actually pursuing VC out of college and yeah. straight out of college, which is quite a risky move, actually. But I think it's interesting to see how that actually sort of sparked an idea in his head. And I mean, in terms of like changing paths, like this is a little bit of like a random ramble, but I, I don't I don't I generally think advice is pretty bad. Like even my own, like it's awful. Like nobody should listen to me on that. Right. But I think that if there were to be a good form of advice, it probably comes in 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 the actual form of questions, right? Or or, yeah. or like asking questions to kind of uh, you know, get that person's thoughts flowing. Um, at the same time, if I think something's the right move for somebody, there's a really, really high chance that I'm wrong there. It's just because, well, the only person that would know really what's best for them is that actual person themselves, right? So on top of that, like like Kathy kind of mentioned, it's really just about having people get the opportunity to be in a really cool VC office, to hear some really awesome guys speak and then talk to them afterwards, right? Um, and I don't think it'd be right or even the best idea for either myself or Kathy to have like a serious impact on these people's like career ambitions or just, you know, what they're interested in. The only thing that I think we would want to provide is, okay, here's something that's cool. And it's completely your choice. Like there's, there's not necessarily a push to that. And, you know, honestly, like, I, I don't think it'd be a great idea if somebody did take her advice from me. So, or, or like, I did have any impact on that. The only thing that like is important is really just saying, okay, cool. Let's get these people uh, excited about stuff. And especially providing that connectivity between kind of industry professionals. Um, overall, as, as the trends continue to shift, um, whether it be high finance, whether it be in tech, there's a lot of overlap between all the technological developments we're currently seeing and the rapid pace of new technologies such as AI. Are these things you consider when like sourcing your guest speakers to keep up with the current trends? Yeah, I mean, Twofold, actually, on that. Um, one, yeah, that's definitely something that's considered. Uh, right now, we're talking to somebody from Deloitte who leads a department um, so surrounding AI and uh, data. So, yeah, that is a consideration. But at the same time, I also think that looking a little bit more macro, the need for community is actually much greater now, right? If you know the analogy, I don't know if it's an analogy, but like the phrase of essentially, it's a little bit too late to explore the world. But at the same time, it's still too early to actually explore the universe, right? I think that it could debatably be used in the context of the, the current AI developments, right? In the sense that it's a little bit too late to have gotten significant traction and progress within a career, like let's say, uh, before the like disruption of AI, right? And it's a little bit too late to, or it's a little bit too early to go through college and throughout this education process with that already being like a mainstay and built into the curriculum, right? There's no such class, at least that I'm aware of, it's, uh, you know, that's like focused on like prompt engineering. And and these changes are happening like relatively quickly, right? Like there's a startup called Ramp, which is pretty cool. Like they're they're funded by, actually, I think they're funded by Contrary and they're based out of New York. But even in their job description for like a UI UX designer, they're already requiring that you're comfortable with using like mid journey and understand how to use prompts and are good at that. And so this stuff is changing like relatively quickly. It's not the type of thing where, okay, now half the jobs are just completely gone. Like there's no, there's no people left, but at the same time, the skill set is probably going to look relatively different. And I mean, that's always the case, right? Like um, Figma, right? It was just like the, the, the current thing that UI UX designers use is probably not going to be the top dog when it comes to, you know, like seven years from now, right? It might be, but there's a solid chance it won't. And so that skill set will always evolve. But the one thing that I think is going to remain constant throughout all this change is the people right like that's in, that's the inherent difference between an ai doing the work and a person during the work right like an ai is not really a you know human okay you can talk about like agi or something like that but at the same time like it's not somebody you're going to hang out with it's not like like one of your friends and at that current moment right that personal connection and that relationship i think is the most important thing so giving people the opportunity for that i think is going to have a lot better time standing the test of time regarding like what are skill sets that, that that matter going forward so that's that's really the emphasis right and just to add on here i think 
we absolutely do see a lot more interest in AI and actually getting AI speakers. Like I've had people personally reach out to me saying, oh, like, when are you going to bring in someone that, you know, works in AI or is developing AI? And so very much there is that growing interest. And we're absolutely trying to source more speakers that sort of work in this AI or Web3 sphere that a lot of people are really interested in. It, it, it's nice to hear you guys are kind of leveraging people's curiosity and it keeps coming back to that theme because um, as you stated, that's kind of where this all started. In terms of networking, as you do connect people, I, I feel like there's this misinterpretation amongst college students about what networking truly should be. Um, yes, you should cold email. Yes, you should reach out to people, but there needs to be a genuine reason why. So I guess upon building this community, how has that learning curve been for you guys from going from the start to where you are now? And what have you learned about what it means to build a true industry connection? Yeah. It's not like I'm just like homies with Mark and Dreesen. So like, yeah, no. So I, I technically have not mastered that yet. Right. Um, but in terms of like the connections that I have made, I think it's almost always been either one from like cold emailing, right? I've never tried the uh the LinkedIn stuff. I don't think that it's actually like most responsive there. Um but in terms of like cold emailing, I think the best way to go about it is usually say something like really, really not necessarily provocative, but like they're gonna read it and be like, wait, what? Like what are you just saying? And then at the end, uh, you know, leave like a call to action and keep it like very short. Something like a calendar link is also like really cool because you know, each email, you can consider it dropping in conversions, right? Like, let's say each email is like a 70% chance to get responded to after the first email was uh, responded to, right? Like, you don't really want to play a game of, okay, well, what time works for you? And, you know, odds are they're probably actually a lot more busy <laughs> than, yeah. than the person emailing. And so they're already kind of doing a favor. It's 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 best to keep that like rather short. So I think Calendly, uh, short outreach, and then a really, really interesting subject line. If people have ever done like cold outreach in terms of sales, right? Like having that really, really like uh, eye-catching subject line. And then, you know, the last thing I'd probably say is like personalization for those is really important. And that would be like the cold outreach side. And then on the call, the the main thing to convey is just like excitement for whatever it is that they do and curiosity. Because I think that a lot of the time passion comes through in tone, not necessarily in the words. And it's rather obvious when somebody's saying, you know, I love entrepreneurship. That's so cool. Like whatever, but they don't actually like believe it and they don't feel it. And I think when somebody is is saying that, like the worst case scenario is you're going to say, okay, well, I like the hustle, but sorry, like we don't have anything. And the best case is they're like, you know what? I like you, screw it. Like you're kind of underqualified, but I'll give you a shot. Um, in terms of like the other type of connections that are not done through cold outreach, I think honestly friends and just building relationships is the most important thing. Um, whether that be just like helping people out for the sake of just like helping out uh, or actively going out to like events and, and and you know just trying to be friendly with people i think that's the number one thing right i don't really believe in the idea well obviously there is always that kind of underlying theme of value for value right and it's like a transactional thing to some extent because every relationship is right that doesn't necessarily have to mean okay well you give me this connect i give you that connect it could just be somebody's like a super nice person fun to be around and you just enjoy their company in exchange you like help them out with yeah you know, something else that they need but at the same time i think it's always better to under ask and always kind of shoot below whatever you think would be like fair in a transaction because at that same time, right? Long-term connections. And it's not necessarily about the amount of people that, you know, it's more of a question of, well, how many people you do know that will actually go to bat for you when it comes down to it. And you can have a thousand connections, but if they're all below that line of where they would actually help you, I'd, like you, you have the equivalent of zero, right? Or you can have like five really, 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 really strong connections. And then you already beat out the thousand. Uh, and those are going to be easier to maintain. Those are going to be, you know, much stronger long term and probably honestly more fun because then you don't have to worry about, you know, managing like a thousand of them. But yeah, that's the general thought there. Right. Yeah. Me and Chris have a little bit of a different like background here as he's very much, much more integrated into like the startup ecosystem here. But I've spent a lot more times in like clubs and on campus organizations. And so a lot of my personal connects and like actual introductions into certain industries have been through these clubs and the club alumni, which I found to be incredibly useful. And so I absolutely recommend like, you know, trying to join whatever venture entrepreneurship club on campus there is and going out of your way to interact with people in the club to like actually get to know them better as individuals. I think everyone tries not to brag about what they can do or what they've done. And 
It's just a matter of like, oh, I want to learn more about you. Can you tell me more? And only then will they actually say, oh, like I've been doing this crazy stuff or like I've spending my years doing this, right? And so I think it's it's just something more about your like drive to actually meet people and your curiosity. And I think that's the fundamental point here is that you're actually curious and you're taking effort to meet people and get to know them. And so like Chris said, right? Having just a few people that can vouch for you at the right time means a lot more than knowing every single person, but none of them will be willing to vouch for you. And so I think it's very important to form those deep connections with people that will become important later on. Jumping off of that point, um, as you guys continue to grow and continue to get more awareness from students, how do you plan on keeping the communal atmosphere while expanding the pie? I think it's a matter of almost sectoring it off by region. And so currently we, we're running this ambassador program and we're just launching this where we have sort of students that operate within a certain area. So for now we have one ambassador at UMich. So all the nearby like Michigan schools, he has really close contact with. And so I think in the future, so far that's worked really well. So in the future, we want to expand that and have ambassadors at you know these more spread out locations that we can't necessarily physically go to. And instead they can be the hubs of that like specific region of the US or globally. And so, uh, I actually really like that. Um, and overall, it, it seems like you've gotten good groundwork set for kind of your plan moving forward over the next year. Can you dive into a little bit about the structure of one of these speaker events that a student would attend and what to expect going in, or if there's any preparation a student should have prior to your events? Yeah, for sure. So we typically send out these events the week before. So students have a week to actually learn about these speakers and we'll obviously send like a short description, what they do and links to whatever information that could help them learn more about the individual. And going into the actual Zoom, we found that keeping these short will actually keep students a lot more like concentrated on what's going on, especially when it's over Zoom, we can kind of tell when people are like out of it or bored from too much talking from just the speaker. And so we keep it short and there's maybe half an hour of moderated Q&A from me and Chris. And then, you know, we'll weave in questions from the actual students throughout mm -hmm. this time. And there'll be another 15 minutes of just live Q&A at the end. So students can do whatever and ask whatever questions they have to the speaker and, you know, I think, like we said before, it's that personalization and the individual knowing what's best for them. And so whatever questions they ask is the most important ones that the speaker should answer for them. And we find Q&A to be really important in helping promote that personalization aspect. And that seems to be a major theme you guys have touched on is continuing to try to make it personal. And as we said, connecting those students directly. From kind of your early time as entrepreneurs, I know, Chris, you that you've been involved with a lot of startup work at NYU. What advice would you give to your peers or other college age students that want to start their own businesses and still have those learning curves in front of them? Yeah. Um, first off, again, like I said earlier, nobody should ever listen to my advice, right? <laughs> so, so everything should be taken with a grain of salt. But I literally got my first job in startups, um, hosting Thing, like parties like that's like the actual answer right um there is this team that was made up of like 17 and 18 year olds and they just raised their pre-seed uh it wasn't for a law but it was you know significant enough to the point where uh you know they did have like a pretty solid marketing budget uh initially they just brought me on i'm like 90 percent sure to just run around <laughs> and and tell people to go down the app but at the same time the task i was given first week was get 50 000 downloads and I had never gotten a download before or done anything related to growth. And I was like, there's zero chance I'm actually going to be able to do this. Right. Uh, and they're like, well, man, you can either sit here and tell us that it's impossible mathematically or whatever you want to do, or you can just like go try and do it. And maybe like you figure it out. And I was like, ah, I don't know. Okay, fine. And so I got really used to the phrase of like IDK, bro, just figure it out. Um, and the thing is it actually did get figured out somewhat, right? That first week we got like 35,000 downloads and it actually worked pretty well. Wow. Uh, from from like past experiences, I guess, every single thing that is done actually leads to, you know, skill sets in the future. Like when I was younger, I was really interested in like fashion, like clothing, right? And that definitely led to an interest in like UI UX or um, playing like a bunch of card games, right? Like poker, blackjack, like whatever. 
and caring about strategy and like psychology and all that like eventually led to well how do you like actually go about growth hacking um and all that is just to say i don't necessarily think there needs to be a right time it's just about saying yeah screw it let's do it and just hopping on it and i mean that i got very lucky in the sense that that was the first team that i ever worked with right uh and that they did give me a chance just because i was also like 17 <laughs> and they're like yeah man just hop on like the, the startup did do well like in the first month it got like two hundred thousand downloads and then you know it later got into yc so it's like i think that a lot of random stuff actually ends up working out and if you consider like a spectrum of like oh whoa it's a little bit weird it's inverse of like this is impossible and this is guaranteed i think a lot of stuff lies like right here right like right 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 next to that impossible side but if you're looking at it from too far away it's like okay well it just looks as if it's in the impossible end um but actually like zooming in you realize oh wait no it's just like ridiculously hard <laughs> and yes there might not be a great chance of actually pulling it off and having it work but if you do you 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 multiply your out outcome by like 30x or something like that right and so it's worth taking these like crazy chances yeah. that have low downside, like mitigate downside and just like play for that, you know, 10% out where you hit like 30 X upside and then it like stacks and, and, and compounds. Um, so I think honestly, just like saying, screw it, let's do it. And, and just going for every single thing. I think it might be daunting for young entrepreneurs when they just look at the pure statistics about the success rate of startups and it often pushes them away from it. However, I believe that even if someone has a good product or a good service, it's largely the people that drive the operation. And as you said, kind of that team that ends up uh, pushing through those, those, those maybe opportunities or the, those ones where you said, I don't know, just get it done. So as you guys have built your team, what have you looked for in those people to have a successful organization and have a successful dynamic? So do you want I can take it. Okay. I think a lot of it was just seeing like who has the grind in them and like who is willing to put in the time, put in the effort and, you know, like actually, for instance, like cold emailing, right? We just outreach to a whole bunch of people just sending emails, like a very repetitive, boring task that takes time, but has insane value ultimately, right? And so I think it was a lot about just finding people that were willing to grind and wanted to grind. And that obviously goes back to that curiosity point and feeling like, you know, this is something that I can make important connects from and also learn a lot of information from because for instance, we had people that, you know, we originally had a template that we were sending out for emails, but they were like, oh, you know, we should change it to do this or we should automate it in this manner. And so they were improving upon the original work that we were giving them. And I think that was a lot of the type of person that we were looking for when we were building our team and people that would be willing to iterate and willing to improve upon existing systems while also just willing to do you know, the hard work and the laborious work that would take time. I also think that, you know, taking this to a broader scale of like, what would be like a cool recipe in general for just like figuring stuff out for like IDK bro, figure it out. Um, <clears throat> so there's like obvious things, right. That, that would go into that formula. You would have like one, just like raw intelligence, right. I don't think IQ actually matters like entirely, but at the same time, like there, there is kind of just like an inherent affinity with like a certain subject, right. Like I'm never going to be like a prodigy level developer. Like I'm not. I can get myself to a decent level, but it's just, there, there are some people that are just always going to have my card, right? And so I think that that one is just like natural inherent talent at a certain skill or like, um, you know, a task that, that'll definitely be one thing. The second thing is like Kathy mentioned, like determination and just like grind and like passion for it. And I think the third thing that honestly gets like overlooked, like constantly, and I don't know if this is the word, right word for it, but I think probably like ambition, right? I, I don't know if ambition is the right word for it, but just like craziness of like, you know what, screw it, let's do it. I know uh, one of my friends, right? Um, when he was younger, he was, he sold like all his like belongings because he was like 10 years old, but he sold all his like toys and stuff or like whatever he had. And then he bought like Tesla shares and then he eventually got to go on like a, a tour and got to meet Elon, right? And he was just like, okay, cool, let me do that. Um, he wanted like a jet ski, like hoverboard or like water thing. And he emailed the company saying like, hey, I did my research on like how you guys engineered this. Can I have one? And they're like, all right, fine, you can have one. Or, you know, for example, um, he wanted to just be like one of the best in the US at math. And he's like, all right, I'm just going to go do it. It's not like he was like bad at math. But the thing is, he was just like, all right, it can't be that hard. And just figured it out. And like, again, I think that it's probably, it has nothing to do with like how necessarily smart someone is or how, you know, determined they are. Like those two are super important. But I think the number one thing is just like, you will hit goals that 
and, and, and outcomes that seem like insanely unrealistic. But if you shoot for them, you're actually going to hit probably like one in 10 times. Obviously, it depends right on, on like the thing you're shooting for. But if you just set your sights like ridiculously high, it'll actually work out more often. And um, if, you, if you're familiar with the term like our like concept of like Parkinson's law, for example, right, like work expands out to the amount of time that's given for it or, you know, contracts the amount of time that's given to it. You know, if there's like an hour to finish the essay before it's due, like, yeah, you're probably going to finish it and it's going to be like 80 percent of the quality or 70 percent of the quality that five hours would have taken. Right. Even though that doesn't actually, uh, y- you know, line up. And I think it's also like the same thing when it comes to figuring stuff out, like even if you pick some ridiculous target, you will probably get further in that in the same amount of time than it would take to get to a, a, a lower target with more time. Um, but yeah, sorry for the rumble, but yeah. No, yeah, that, I think just to like, perfect. No, keep going, keep going. I think just like an important takeaway from that point would be to that, you need to think about risk as like, risk taking isn't as risky as you think. Like, you know, you always imagine the downsides of doing X, Y, and Z, but obviously benefits are also on your mind, but you're not necessarily focusing on that. You're just thinking about what could go wrong or what would happen if like, you know, this terrible thing occurred and all these impacts it would have on your daily life. When in reality, like if you're actually putting in the time and you're putting in the effort and you want it to become the best, then I think your effort really matters in the pursuit, especially in the startup world. A lot of it is about, you know, how much effort are you putting in as an individual or as a team to actually build a great startup or a great team. How do you find a balance between shooting for high expectations and going for it without becoming blinded by maybe some, a little bit of overconfidence or maybe some faults in your product or faults in your business model that you may not see because you're shooting for these high expectations? Yeah, I mean, I realize that I suck at almost everything and that's probably like the best thing. Right. Like I, I will obviously like, it, it makes sense to shoot for like the highest heights. Right. But at the same time, being like hyper critical um, of every single thing that, that you're doing, I think makes a lot of sense as well. Um, there's a difference between saying like, okay, cool. Like let's shoot for this versus, you know, presenting it either to yourself or to others. So to see, this is definitely going to happen. Right. Just being realistic with odds. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of a default answer to just say, okay, well, you know what, just like be realistic with yourself of, of what's possible. But at the same time, um, I think it's just about trying stuff and epically failing like enough times to where you kind of calibrate to, okay, this is like super ambitious, but at the same time, there's actually like a possibility of this happening instead of like, you know, if I spend like five hours learning, maybe some like front end work and then try and do something that's going to give me like X percent odds, but X percent odds after five hours is going to be a lot higher than if I spent that entire five hours directly working on, on on doing it in the first place, right? It's like, okay, well, if I don't know how to do something, I try and shoot for the moon or shoot for the stars, whatever the saying is, right? I'm probably not going to hit it because I have no clue how to do it. <laughs> and it makes more sense to actually decrease the amount of like attempts that I get, but increase the probability of each of them happening. Um, but yeah. So just, I guess, over the course of your time as an entrepreneur, and your various ventures you've kind of recalibrated yourself to understand that balance a little bit better well i've just every single time i do something because i haven't exited so technically nothing's ever quote unquote like worked to an insane level right but um being just like super super critical of like every single thing that i did not necessarily critical in the sense of oh i suck boohoo more as like i i I genuinely really really care about uh startups and and you know building awesome stuff and so when I realized that I did something wrong, which is basically every single time, like even when I do something like quote unquote works, right? I'll be like, okay, how could it work better? Like, what did I do wrong in this process? Um, I think one thing that like I really, really, really realized throughout this entire time, and I think it was like super important, and I wish I'd done it earlier, is building skill set simultaneously, like like in parallel to making progress. And I think that this is actually like debated with one of the most important things. So if we consider like a function like y equals like x to the z, for example, right? X to like the power of z. Uh, x is a representation of like, let's say your current salary, where you work, um, you know, what, what 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 place you live at, right? Things that are in the present moment. Z is more so about like the connections that you've made, the skill set that you have like developed, and you know, the experiences that you've had. I focused, I think, in the past way too much on expanding X and focusing on present progress, right? I think and in, 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 in practice, what that generally looks like is, well, if you're trying to make the most progress, you're probably going to stick to your guns and pick the thing that you're actually best at to, to push forward. 
But the thing is that stunts growth like long term because you're just getting really, really good at the same things that you're already like pretty decent at without kind of noticing your weak spots. And then all of a sudden when X gets reset to zero or the thing doesn't work and you're you're back to square one, you realize, oh, wait, it's going to take me a ton of time because I didn't focus on Z. So now it's just going to be like super slow. You know, it's, it's more of a thing of, OK, well, not to say put all your eggs into one basket with Z, because if you're. Your initial principle is like tiny. Well, you're you're like you only live for X amount, like you know, a certain amount of years. So it's not like you're gonna be able to just get your Z to a million with like a point zero 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 one X, right? But it's more so just I think finding a balance between picking difficult tasks that are slightly out of my comfort zone or beyond what I think I could accomplish and really choosing those. I'm like 70% confident I can do it, 30% I can't. Um, and then just having somebody that I know can kind of clean up the mess if if I'm not able to do that. But focusing on both skill set development and present progress and finding that balance, I think, is probably the most important thing and the thing I messed up on the most in the past. <clears throat> in terms of choosing those tasks that stretch you a little bit, um, a lot of students are focused on specialization nowadays. Do you find there to be an importance of having a broad range of skill sets or is it more kind of deep diving within a sector and picking those skills within there that you still haven't developed? Yeah, I mean, I'm an awful example of that. <laughs> I just like doing so many things. It's like hard. But I do think that there is a little bit of like people say like, oh, don't be a generalist, be like very specific. And this actually harkens back to one of the talks that we had with um, he was a creative director. At, if you know, PopCap, um, they created like Bejeweled, Plants vs. Zombies. And then during that acquisition, uh, he went on to like go work in big tech. He went he worked at Microsoft and then most recently Amazon. And um, what he was talking about is just going like very like wide in college. It's like picture like the letter T, like a capital T, right? Like the top is like super wide. And then there's just like one straight line down. Um, and he spoke about how during school, try and like get as much surface area as possible. And then during the career, really, really, really drill that one point home. I do think that there is like extreme value in specializing in one thing. But at the same time, I'd rather pick a thing that I have like, you know, I'm playing with leverage with, right? Um, it's something that comes like super naturally to me. And that's something I really enjoy doing. And finally, I think that there is value to knowing like a, a solid amount of skills in terms of, okay, let's say, you know, front end and, you know, UI UX, you can now move a lot faster than, you know, a designer and a developer on, on their own. Right. To add on here, I think it's also sort of dependent on what industry you want to actually go into, right? Like say you're going the traditional finance routes, you obviously want to be really good at finance. You want to be good with numbers, good with accounting good with Excel, whatever, you need that like singular spike. But I think in the startup ecosystem, it's a lot more about being a generalist and sort of having the skills and ability to like troubleshoot everything, right? Especially as a founder, you sort of have problems that come up all over the place and you need that general knowledge of literally everything, right? To like solve every problem instead of having that single spike. And so I think your question here is dependent on what you actually want to pursue in the future. But I agree with Chris very much here in that we're sort of told not to be a generalist, but I think especially in our college years, it's best to be one and to learn about everything as much as possible. Well, it's, yeah, and it is important to not be a generalist like long term, right? But I think there's like a huge set of rules for like what a founder could be, right? You could be like somebody that specializes in biz dev, right? You could be somebody that specializes in growth, somebody that specializes in, you know, like the the actual tech that's the underlying tech. And there's like a bunch of different pathways to take it. So I think especially during college, right? The first job that you get out of school is most likely not going to be like a, a startup role or whatever. Um, and kind of just like, you know, honing your craft on that one specific skill, like after school. And who am I to say any of these things? Because I know zero about that, because I haven't graduated school yet. So, you know, disclaimer on that. But I think that would probably be the best, the best approach. And in terms of, um, okay, so you, you talked about your first job out of school, most likely is not in the startup environment. However, at the same time, taking that jump and taking that risk early on in your career can provide you with a lot of those valuable skill sets that may help you um, in sort of that Z rather than X mentality. I was wondering personally, I know startups are often hit with unexpected changes and unexpected turns on a daily basis. What is your mindset when you're faced with a fork in the road or a major problem that you didn't expect and it has to be solved quickly? <laughs> you want me to go there? okay um just like take one second and go 
oh, that's not good. <laughs> and then just be like, well, let's get to it, right? Obviously, like, I, I don't have the most experience in the world, but there are definitely times where we're like, like something I was working on was like completely screwed. <laughs> and we were just in like an awful, awful, awful spot. And I think with just over time, you just get used to, okay, well, this is not great. Uh, it, there's probably not a high chance that we're going to be able to fix this, but it basically needs to be done. Let's think of like ways that uh, it can be solved. And I think that the number one thing with that is just being comfortable with being in a really bad spot um, and realizing, okay, there's like a bunch of other solutions. If, you know, you consider like a wall with a set of doors, right? And like your field of vision is, you know, like, shoot, this is like confusing me. <laughs> your field of vision is like this. If you keep on zooming out, eventually, you'll eventually find like some crack in that wall. Okay, cool. Let's like push there. And then, you know, kind of kind of go that path. So even if mathematically, for example, uh, let's say you needed X amount of downloads in a week with Y budget, right? And the CPM and the user acquisition cost doesn't actually add up there, right? You're going to need more than Y dollars to be able to get X amount of users. Okay, well then it's okay. Well, let's think beyond ads, right? Like what what actually like works beyond um, you know, CPC ads. So something like that, I think, uh, would be the biggest thing. Just like making light of it and making fun of it, and just being like, well, that's not good. And then picking a solution that you're pro. If you're if you're if you're saying that's not good, it's probably not going to be a solution that you can solve, or the solution is probably not going to be something that's like standard. Because mm -hmm. if that were the case, you probably wouldn't be there in the first place. But yeah. And then just picking like some really weird solution for it. So it seems like that ability to kind of zoom out and pick an alternate path that might not have seemed so obvious um, when you look at the problem so closely. That's just, I don't know. I played a lot of Magic the Gathering. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I was younger, but there's like a concept of like playing the outs. Um, and, you know, like in marketing campaigns, right? There's like such a thing as like key KPIs, right? Like key performance indicators. And there's certain things that you're like shooting for. If your goal is to, you know, become a billionaire in life, your career path probably looks insanely different than somebody that wants to reach 10 million. And honestly, if you're trying to reach a billion dollars, your probability of reaching, like if you optimize for reaching a billion dollars for somebody that optimized for hitting 10, 10 million, you know, I think, or maybe not 10, but like a hundred million, I think on average, your, 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 your like out, uh, outcome throughout life is actually lower than the person that went, that went for a hundred. So I think clearly defining what it is that has to be solved, right? Is the solution here for the thing that's going bad to, I don't know, uh, mitigate damage? Or is it to actually like flip it and actually get a, a really positive outcome? And then that kind of changes the way that you quote unquote play to outs, right? Because there are certain times where you need to take a riskier play because that's the only way that you're actually able to achieve the goal that you wanted. Without clearly defining kind of what the ideal outcome is of that situation, it's hard to pick, okay, well, this is a really risky play. This is not going to work like 90% of the time, but this 10%, we like 10%, it actually works 90% it fails within like, let's say, you know, three days, or you could pick the thing where, okay, in six months, there's like a 0.1% chance this works. Right. But it's, you got six months, but it's like, okay, well, you know, it's kind of a debate there. And obviously during that six months, a lot could change. You might be able to figure it out, but it is kind of always like a, um, like strategy in that sense. And that's where kind of the managerial discretion comes into play. And at the end of the day, as you said, that's where the people come into play. And moving back, I guess, uh, and, and taking a step back towards the main theme of our conversation, I want to tie this back into Fireside. So overall, as people attend your events, and I'm hoping soon or eventually there's some in the Boston area for people near me, um, how do you continue to facilitate getting people involved? that are not in your core community. So you talked about um, kind of expanding to um, try to get a, a broad range of students. What are the specific ways and specific people you've connected with in that, in that journey? Yeah, I think, I mean, currently we aren't actually doing like severe outreach efforts or anything. We're not like actually putting a lot of time there. It's a lot of word of mouth currently and you know we have like on our application form it says like oh where did you hear about us and overwhelmingly recently it's all been word of mouth and so I think hosting these really great events with really great people that's how we're going to get more people involved and more people interested right because once they go to one of these cool events like, oh like I think I have this friend that'd be interested they tell their friends and they continue to tell other friends and so I think word of mouth is very much the important piece here and Chris, you want to ask me? And I think also just like hanging out with people, 
Um, I was literally in your city the other day uh, for um, TechCrunch early stage. Uh, I went oh, to nice. just go hang out. Uh, and I don't know, like one of the people that I was talking to, like he's a, he's a senior at Northeastern that's going to go for a graduate degree. And he was just saying, yeah, I know he's like a venture scout for a couple of funds. And I was like, oh yeah, dude, <laughs> you want to like help us out with this stuff? And he's like, yeah, man, hundred percent. So I just hung out with him for the day. And, you know, as long as I think people <laughs> go to stuff and are living and just like go outside, like, yeah, hundred percent, you're just going to meet people. And like how they said, like that word of mouth effect uh, will come into play and, and, and lead growth. All right. Well, speaking of word of mouth, before we wrap things up, I just want to give you guys a chance to plug where people can find you, um, where they can sign up for fireside events, or maybe some upcoming ones that you might want to promote. Sure. So our upcoming event is actually tomorrow. It's with Brandon Kumar, the founder of Layer 3, which is this like Web3 education platform. And he actually went to my high school. So I've hosted awesome. him for other events before. And I think he's a really great speaker and, you know, is really knowledgeable about Web3 and like blockchain and all this tech stuff. And also VC because he worked at Accolade Partners, which is this VC firm in Washington, D.C. And so I think he's like the perfect encompassment of like everything we want to know in this program. And in terms of actually where to apply, at fireside.bio is our website. There's an application form on there. And you can find our socials on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter. What else do we have? I don't know. <laughs> that's about it. I think that's about it for now. But, you know, maybe we'll expand awesome. in the future. Hope you enjoyed that episode. If you like our content, subscribe. The button is below. If you want to see another video, our latest one is right here or another one right here. Two options, two videos. Have a great day.